Welcome back to Heads and Tails with me. I'm Henry Faber, one of the founders at Oppidan Education, and I'm delighted and very privileged today to have Tom Ravenscroft with me to talk about Skills Builder Partnership and his journey through education. Now, Tom is a bit of a guru and a very highly accomplished one at that. He founded the Skills Builder Partnership back in 2009 while teaching in a secondary school in Hackney. And today, I think the partnership brings together around 550 schools and colleges, 130 plus employers, and over 100 other skills building organizations around a common language and an approach to building essential skills, which sits very closely with everything we love and admire at Opperden. The partnership won the UK Social Enterprise Award for Impact in 2017, and Tom's been recognized multiple times as a UK Entrepreneurship Teacher of the Year in 2009, as well as being an Ashoka Fellow in 2017. He's also published a book, The Missing Piece, which I'm hoping to ask a bit about today. So Tom, thanks very much for joining us. I'd love to start on the mentoring idea. Did you have a mentor of your own? Have you been mentored? Are you aware of mentorship growing up? We'd love to hear your reflections on that. Yeah, I mean, I just think mentorship is so important. And, um, and, you know, I've been incredibly lucky, I think, along the way to have, you know, I've never had one single mentor, um, but I've had lots of people who were able to give me really good advice, sometimes a good challenge at different points. Um, so when I was setting up um, my social enterprise, for example, I was lucky enough that uh, a guy called Brett Wigdorts, who set up Teach First, um, was was somebody who I was able to to talk through the the practicalities and also some of the angst uh, that comes with uh, setting up a social enterprise. Um, more recently, as we've been looking at, well, how do we try to get wider change in the education system? Um, the people who've done, you know, been working in this field for years, like um, Dame Julia Cleverdon, for example, fantastic, uh, well-connected person who can help to to open doors for new ideas. So, yeah, I've been really lucky along the way. And can I ask, what about your own time at school? Did you love school? What what kind of brought you to working in education, I suppose, from that background mm. and context? Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I was really lucky with um, with my schooling. Um, so uh, I went to a primary school and middle school, um, which I loved. Um, I went to an all boys uh, state school then, which I found took a bit more adjusting to <laughs> going from, uh, you know, a pretty small primary school into uh, a much bigger um into a bigger place um but uh you know I I always enjoyed always enjoyed learning and I think people who work in education tend to have either really loved school or to have found it awful and want to do it completely differently uh, it's been my experience of people uh, I've worked with in the education sector um but you know along the way I suppose you know one of the things which I got most value out of was all of the co-curricular stuff um, that I had the the chance to do. And I was very lucky with the school I had that we had that broader uh, education. Um, and that was something which I think, you know, helped be able to some of the, the skills I think are really important um, the rest of my life. So, so let's spend a little bit of time about that teaching experience in Hackney. Mm. What was it like? Any anecdote, any stories from then, things that you loved or things that you learned along the way through that early experience? Yeah, I mean, so it was intense. I think is the uh, <laughs> is uh, is the key word. So I went from um, so I studied uh, Oxford um, for through university. I studied economics and and management, and um, and I just had this sense that actually I wasn't excited about the the sort of the usual routes people go off the back of that course. So normally into uh, almost always into business, um, often into banking. Um, and uh, and one day I was chatting to a friend who'd started teaching and um, and she was basically telling me, you know, what to most ears I think would sound like horror stories of, you know, trying to re-engage kids who perhaps hadn't been that excited about their education for a while, um, trying to, to, to raise the expectations for, um, you know, for what they could achieve. And I just thought it sounded like a terrific uh, challenge and a, and a big adventure and so I sort of I plowed into it fairly naively going straight from finals into to teacher training about two weeks later and then teaching a full roster of classes from the September um, and you know and of course there are really tough bits and I remember you know Ofsted came in within a couple of months of me starting um, I was reassured by the senior teachers of course they wouldn't come into you know such a new teacher's classroom and of course there they were the very first lesson of their inspection uh, with my most challenging year 11 group um and uh, and I remember that uh, one of the kids was 
It was just messing around, chucking stuff around, and something bounced off the door, and a split second later, the door opened, and the inspector walked in. And I just think, like, had that been a second uh, difference, that would have hit them squarely, and that would probably have been the end of my teaching career. So, you know, there are small moments of, of luck in that. Um, but I think the thing that that really struck me overall was that, yes, it was challenging and there were, you know, there are challenges about behaviour as, you know, as a, there often are with these things, especially when you're a new a new teacher and you're being tested. Um, but I think what struck me most was just how shortchanged some of the kids I was working with had been um, in terms of education and just how narrow the the focus of what they've been taught was and they hadn't developed any of those broader skills you know creativity problem solving leadership teamwork the ability to plan or to adapt um and that just felt like you know they've missed out on having a what i would consider a complete education do you do do you feel like as a teacher you were immediately suitable to sort of build and run your own organization or was it the ideology and the interest in what you were doing with skills that led Mm. you to running an organization which way around yeah it's interesting so I hadn't really intended to set up an organization so what I started with was I started by designing a course um, to build uh, those broader skills for my students uh, which we now call essential skills and so I developed this course because I I wanted my students to build those skills we could see that without them they weren't going to thrive at college or university um, or in the workplace and so it sort of felt important. And I started sharing it then with some other teachers, you know, having put all the time into actually building this thing. Um, and they started seeing some good results for their students too. And so that was, I suppose, after a, a year or so, I thought, well, actually maybe this should be a, this should be an organization so it could be shared more widely. Um, but I definitely didn't imagine I'd be still doing it 14 years later or that we'd have <laughs> grown to, to what we've grown to. It's one of those things where if you were shown the route and how tough it is along the way, you sort of look back, you never do it again. But but actually... Yeah, I think that's true. It, yeah. <laughs> but if you don't know what's to come, you don't know. So, you know, ignorance is bliss. Indeed. I mean, you're, you, you know, you've had incredible impact on teachers and on teaching, but you are one of those many people who left teaching. Um, mm-hmm. What what do you think is needed to keep teachers in in school and keep teachers engaged with the passion that they have when they first start out? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think for me, I, you know, the, uh, when I left, it wasn't ever with the intention of leaving, leaving, I really thought I was going to set this thing up for a couple of years and then go, you know, pick up where I left off in terms of teaching. Um, Because there is a huge amount that's, you know, rewarding and worthwhile. And, you know, you know, that you're having a a really tangible, meaningful impact if you're doing it well. Um, So I think there's a huge amount to, uh, to commend uh, teaching as a, as a profession um and you know you see the most remarkable teachers I do think it's incredibly intense though um as a as a profession to be in you know I think there's an interesting question about whether it should ever be an expectation that somebody could spend their whole career doing that very intense work of uh of teaching day in day out and actually I think there's you know probably a case of you know giving people the opportunity to to flex and to work in different areas and use their own transferable skills in different settings is probably a good thing um, but I also think that there's lots of things at the moment which um, sap a lot of teaching energy, um, which I think could be fixed. Um, and I think not least is the increasingly myopic focus on whether you're a good teacher, which basically comes down to the the grades your students get in your particular subject. Um, and I think while, you know, particularly at secondary school, teachers are passionate about their subjects, um, they're also in teaching because they want to help young people develop. And I think sometimes there's less focus on that and there's more focus on um, just getting through the um, the assessment process. Mm. With the with the skills framework in mind, with your skills framework mm-hmm. in mind, what do you think are two or three great qualities that a teacher needs to have to see mm. what you've developed, put into practice with their own students? Yeah, of course. So I think, you know, I think one of the um, the key things is around firstly being effective as a a communicator right because there's a lot of information um, that you're trying to convey as a teacher Um, but of course the flip side of communication is also being able to receive and I think you know if really effective teachers are able to understand and to gauge what their students have or haven't understood and then be able to be really adaptive uh, in response to that so you've got to have people who are who have that nimbleness I suppose in terms of being able to to flex and work around 
um, students learning because that isn't necessarily always a linear um, process. I think there's a great scope for creativity in teaching too. I think, um, you know, certainly what we've seen with Skills Builder is, you know, the, the way we help teachers is by helping them think through what the process is of people building essential skills. But we don't try to, to tell them exactly what they should be doing. We give them this framework and actually, once they know the learning objectives, they can come up with brilliant ideas and brilliant activities and exercises and um, scenarios to help hone and practice those skills. So I think giving teachers that scope for creativity is important. And I think the final thing I'd say is, you know, I think teaching is leadership. Um, I think the the most effective teachers are, are really effective leaders. You know, they bring the students they work with with them. Um, they help them to uh, stay motivated and excited about the future and to realise their own potential as well. Um, so I think that's critical. Lovely. Um, your book, The Missing Piece, love, love to hear a little bit more about that. Tell mm. us more. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote it back in 2017 because uh, essentially um, I was sick to death of reading about uh, cognitive load theory um, and how uh, and how one had to just teach by rote facts. And if you taught enough facts then everything else would take care of itself. And to me, that didn't resonate, you know, at all with my experience of, of teaching and certainly not uh, the the uh, the experience of teachers I'd worked with for a decade um, by that point. And that's not to say I don't think there's a really important role for that sort of learning. There, there absolutely is, you know, and you need to have that core of knowledge, but it doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't make you uh, have the ability to create and test hypotheses, for example, or to use logical reasoning, um, even if you have the subject content knowledge. And so the idea with the missing piece was to try to dig in and to be a bit more critical um, of, I think, some of the short-sighted consensus that have been forming around um, around education and the fact that knowledge was the only thing that seemed to matter. Um, and so what we drew out was, you know, strong evidence that actually essential skills plus knowledge plus literacy plus numeracy is actually the combination that everybody needs, and you can't shortcut that. Um, but also we drew out some really important principles for how um you can go about building those skills love that so i had an interesting conversation with ollie newton about um from edge about mm -hmm. the kind of revolutionary versus evolutionary nature of education and how it's moving and changing and you know a focus on skills which is clearly increasing and clearly moving in the right direction but for you what are the big what's going to move the needle on on bringing the stuff that you've developed more to the fore and more practically into the workings mm. of, of the education sector? Yeah, great question. So I think the, I think there's a couple of points on this. I mean, uh, one is, you know, so it's now been sort of 14 years, I guess, that I've been working on a skills builder and how do you build essential skills? Um, and how do you do that with real rigor and focus? And I think what I've seen over that time is that teachers are passionate about developing the whole child, the whole young person. Um, they don't want to only be thinking about the exam result, and that isn't why they went into teaching to start with. So I think actually you've got a, a constituency there who are very keen uh, to be able to do this and, and enthusiastic about doing it. And so then we've got to think about, well, what are the barriers, what are the constraints that stop that from happening at the moment? And it's stuff like, you know, timetable availability, resource availability, um it's about you know what training a teacher is actually getting to build their confidence in developing these skills for their students and how do you how do you build that in whether that's in you know it's in service uh training or whether it's uh through university uh pre-teaching courses um but then crucially how do you change the accountability measures because actually if you could do all of this stuff but ultimately if you only measure success as being exam results then you're never going to get that alignment through the system. And so we're working on some really exciting partners, including Ollie um, and others looking at, you know, how can you get that sort of um, recognition of building essential skills as being a core part of um, what that complete education looks like. And are you optimistic? I am optimistic. Um, I know, <laughs> partly because you've got to be. Um, but also because, you know, one of the 
one of the things about Skills Builder is that, yes, we're UK based and UK focused, but we also work in 10 other countries. Um, and in some of those countries, we've seen Skills Builder being adopted at a national level, at a policy level. So it's being built into the national curriculum. It's being built into national assessment. It's in teacher training. Um, we, you know, work with the the publishers um, who create the the resources and materials that are used in schools. So actually, it's perfectly possible for um, this to be built into an education system, and every child to have the opportunity to build those skills. Um, and I think that's just something that the, um, particularly the. Uh, the English education system, because I think Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland are also moving far more in this direction already. But I think in England, I think there's quite a lot that we we can catch up on. Mm. Perhaps it's untangling some of the cobwebs around the exam system and the kind of exit system from school. Mm. And maybe after that, you release some of the pressure on teachers and free up some of the time. It feels like a lot of it's to do with structuring mm. in schools innately as well, with how schools are run and structured. Yeah, I often I feel so. like you're, you're climbing onto a, as a teacher, you're climbing onto an oil rig every term and then it's impossible to get off it. And how could you possibly engage with new and innovative and exciting things mm-hmm. when um, when you're so frustrated by all the, the kind of quagmire of the day to day? Yeah, difficult. Yeah, exactly. And it shouldn't rely on, you know, it shouldn't rely on teachers being heroes to, to build these skills. I mean, mm. uh, you know, it should be, it should just be part of, you know the the incentive system right and how people are, mm. are recognized and rewarded and i don't mean that sort of financially they should be paid for extra for doing this i think it should just be a normal part of of good of good teaching but um i think what what's really critical is that you you can't just tell te- you can't tell teachers that they should be doing this but that the only thing that you'll actually make any sort of judgment on at the end is the exam results because you know that that just doesn't uh just doesn't align makes sense so as we recognize there are some challenges but for you personally um it it obviously looks like from the outside it's been an amazing 14 years i'm sure there have been tricky bits to overcome what have been the the kind of biggest roadblocks to progress that you feel like you found a way around yeah yeah no but yeah i mean i'm glad it looks great externally um <laughs> the, uh, you know Paddling i think, like I think mad. Yeah. exactly well i'm sure you have that exact same uh same experience as well i mean i think you know one of the one of the real tipping points for us was in 2017 so it was about the same time as writing this book and uh, i suppose the book was partly I suppose it reflected my frustration at that point that, you know, we've been building this thing for nearly 10 years at that point. We, you know, we felt there were these huge headwinds because actually the direction that education policy was going, we felt was in the wrong direction. And, um, but at the same time, you know, we'd grown to work with about uh, about 60 or 70,000 students a year, which, you know, I think was, you know, meaningful, but, um, but, you know, the the point was that we really believed that this should just be a normal part of every student's experience. And so we were thinking, well, how can we make this breakthrough? How can we can we make a change that goes beyond us sort of, you know, trying to do it all ourselves and actually realising that there are so many fantastic organisations who buy into this vision? And, and what could we do together to try to, um, you know, to, to align our efforts around this? And so that's where we progressed, I guess, into this sort of, idea of the skills builder partnership and we had this shared language and shared approach around essential skills which then everyone takes and adapts and uses in different ways um so that might be on a school by school level it might be people like um national citizen service taking it and building it into um their programs um or young enterprise which is another partner or or people like uh, harlequin's rugby uh, foundation who use sport as a vehicle to build some of these broader skills um so actually you can build these skills in lots of different ways but what we've realized is that by not trying to do it all ourselves and instead to try to convene this brilliant partnership around doing it um that was what was gonna that was what was gonna help accelerate um the progress i suppose that that point of frustration then we turned into uh something of a pivot in terms of our approach um and then this last year across the partnership um we delivered 2.3 million um opportunities to build essential skills and so you know we really see that opening up that working in partnership together has been um has been really transformational for us 
That's great. Good and good inspiration for those of us who feel we're always facing headwinds. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are always new headwinds. Um... <laughs> yeah, always new headwinds. I guess just to finish, we're nearly out of time, but to, to finish, um, back to you personally, you've achieved a lot in, in the last 14 years as a relatively young, I should say, uh, you know, inspirational leader. What are you hoping for in the next 10? What, what, what do you want to achieve personally, I suppose, that you're happy to share with us? Mm. So I suppose the big thing for me is that I feel like we've got to a point where we've demonstrated that it's perfectly possible for um, for everyone to build their essential skills and to make progress and to unleash new opportunities as a result. And so the challenge is, well, how do you take that to scale then? Um, and for us, that means thinking about areas where we've been less engaged in the past. So, you know, what does it look like in terms of policy, for example, at a you know, national education policy level? Um, how can we learn from some of the best practice that we're beginning to see in other international settings and, and draw that together? Um, what does it really look like to, you know, there are obviously tens of thousands um, of teachers in the education system. What would it actually look like for, for all of them to build their confidence in building essential skills? So, you know, there's some really big, um, interesting uh, problems there to, to chew over um, and that will undoubtedly keep me entertained for the next decade. That's great. Lovely place to end. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing all that insight and hope everyone who doesn't know enough about the Skills Builder Partnership will check it out. And thank you for sharing your time with us today. Pleasure. Thank you.